Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, October 15th, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today did publish a diary with a phishing attack example that took advantage of blob URLs. Blob URLs are really binary large object that what blob stands for. And it's one of those cases where the content of the file is actually in the URL. That, of course, makes it relatively stealthy and hard to detect on the network layer. DocuSign, a very often fished brand. On Mastodon, there was some discussion about this blog post about the feasibility of teaching users uh, not to click on blob URLs or recognizing blob URLs. That's a tricky undertaking. There are similar things that can be used to obfuscate URLs and make them more difficult to detect to the user. In my opinion, one thing that's if you think about user training here, that may work better is just to make them aware of, to be wary of various websites that all of a sudden are asking, for example, here for bank account information, social security numbers, telephone numbers, telephone pin, whatever that is, and then sending you an electronic funds transfer authorization agreement. As far as I know, DocuSign actually doesn't require really any kind of login when you're signing a document. So I think uh, these kind of behaviors probably makes more sense uh, teaching users because that's also something that's not as easily blocked uh, with automated means like blob URLs. Blob URLs leave that up uh, to the machines to detect and uh, teach your users really sort of this uh, bad behavior uh, that you often see in uh, phishing attacks like this. And then we got some more details regarding a recent 40 net 40 gate vulnerability CVE 2024-23113. Watchtower did uh, publish a deep dive into the vulnerability, uh, some of the difficulties exploiting it and also how these mitigations work. This is an attack that already had been exploited, so it's not that Watchtower here is releasing any new proof of concept before it was exploited. Also, there appear, according to some scans by the Shadow Server Foundation, plenty of vulnerable targets out there. This is yet another SSL VPN vulnerability. Now it's a format string vulnerability, which is uh, not that common as Watchtower points out. Also tends to be a little bit more difficult to exploit than some of the simpler vulnerabilities that we have seen before in devices of this class. The SL VPN vulnerability in this particular case is somewhat mitigated by requiring that the connection originates from a client that actually has a value signed certificate. That way you already make it quite a bit more difficult for an attacker to take advantage of this vulnerability. Still, a patching is recommended in particular with the active exploitation already happening. And Jack Marks published a blog post showing how some popular open source repositories for libraries like PIP, uh, NuGet, and NPM uh, can be abused in order to trick a developer into executing arbitrary code. The trick here are command line entry points. And the way this usually is supposed to work is if you're installing particular packages, they have an example here as a good package, a PyTest, the Python test package. It also installs some command line tools, uh, like in this case, PyTest, that you then can call like any other command line uh, program. The problem is that malicious packages may, of course, do the same thing. And if you have name confusion here, if uh, the malicious binary is installed in a path that's checked before some of the official paths are being checked, then it's certainly possible for malicious packages to install command line utilities that mimic the use of uh, well-known command line utilities that you may already have installed. Interesting exploit kind of surprises me that it took attackers so long to figure this out, but uh, definitely something to be aware of. Not sure if there's any sort of great protection here because the developer here often is being tricked into installing the malicious packages via typo squatting and similar issues. 
And for example, for Python, one of the common recommendations is to rely on wheel files instead of tar GC files, because there is typically no code being executed if you're installing a wheel file. While with tar files, we have compilers running and the like, and code execution is certainly possible. But of course, these command line utilities are still being installed with wheel files. So that's a way how the safety feature of wheel files can actually be bypassed. Well, that's it for today. Hope to see some of you at our workshop today at 10 a.m. Eastern and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.